Welcome back, everybody. This is the Resistance Broadcast. I'm John. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a very cool episode in store for you guys. It is Monday. I know it is uh, Project Luminous Day, so we're all going to be involved checking that stuff out. But the Clone Wars <laughs> is back, guys. It's back, baby! <laughs> and the first episode's been out, and there's obviously new music in the Clone Wars, so we figured, why don't we talk to the guy who makes the music for the Clone Wars, so later on in the episode, right after the Will of the Force, not the Will of the Force, sorry, James, it's just Will of the Force. I'm so sequel trilogy <laughs> focused, everything has a the in front of it. Uh, let me compose myself for a second. You brought that over from about, Twitter, was, you're so was lame. Was all that over, was all of that set up? <laughs> No, yes. it wasn't. He tweeted wasn't. that out. You are such a I liar. I brought it in. I brought it in. I brought it in. Improvisational. Uh, oh, uh, I'm like geez. a regular tendal- tendaloin. Um, right after Will of the Force, we're going to do a little uh, interview discussion with Kevin Kiner, the composer for The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. Um, it was uh, it was a, a great discussion, but we'll talk more about that in, in a bit. Uh, but... Um, I, I don't know, guys. Like, I don't want to touch too much about the interview, but I, I thought it went really well. I thought it was a, it was a good time, and I can't wait for them to check it out in a little bit, right? Yeah. Yep. I think we <laughs> should also <laughs> comment on how James has a new Clone Wars video going out every Friday. Yeah, yes. James, what's... Oh, I thought you were going to talk about his haircut, but we can... I we mean, can he does have a great haircut, but... Great haircut. We're talking about the Clone Wars, so... Yeah. Figured. James, what's the deal? Yeah. So... I I think the basic idea here is that after, I mean, I put out one on Friday, but if after every episode airs, I'm getting up early, I'm watching (laughs) the episode, I'm putting everything together and trying to get it out, um, you know, morning to afternoon or whatever uh, will hopefully be the goal. And it's just going to be like an episode recap. Think Mando fan show as this one is uh, the Clone Wars fan show, Um, but it's just me and uh, I'll have a... Uh, I'm I'm trying to like chop it down to like a, a good uh, chunkable size. You know, you could just take it in, get get the recap, um, get uh, my opinions on it, and uh, talk a little bit about the possibility of the future. I ju- I think it, I, it's fun. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about the Clone Wars, and I'm excited to talk about it. So, Clone nice. Wars fan show express. The Clone right. Wars fan show. Um, so actually, when- I've never watched Clone Wars, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Nice. Did they have a did they have a Pizza Hut Express at the Holiday Inn Express by any chance? Yes, and uh, so, they actually had a men's clothing store, but I can't remember what it was called. Hmm. If you guys know, pop it in the comments. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. When James and I were talking about the that whole thing, I was like, "So you know, there's like Pizza Hut." And then there's a Pizza Hut Express. And I didn't know if you knew what a Pizza Hut Express was because... Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it worked out. Because the one the, near the Target in the famous Target in Bethel, Connecticut that you stayed near has a Pizza Hut Express in it. So Is that an, of, a yeah. Pizza Hut Express? I ate there. Yeah. You did eat there? Yeah. I thought you walked 40 <laughs> minutes to Popeye's. This guy hit everything in, everything in the in the Danbury area. All right. I did the the second day or something like that, but I just had pizza the, the first day. Um, <laughs> All right, guys. Yeah. Why don't we send it to James now to get our Star Wars appetites and brains going before the interview with Kevin Kiner in Will of the Force. What's up, Baney? I fear nothing for all this as the Force wills it. Cheer it. It's always good to hear your voice. Love that you can make it out to the show every week. <laughs> uh, Will the Force, uh, we got a couple questions. Um, let's go ahead and get started into this because I want to start talking about the world between worlds. And that is what our first question has to deal with. Uh, this one comes from one of our patrons, uh, specifically Commander Scott Gibson. He wants to know, will we ever see the world between worlds in live action? So, Lacey, I'm going to jump to you first. Do you think there's any chance that we're going to see this in live action? So, my heart wants to say yes, because there's all these people throwing around Ben Solo being there. Are you about to Aguilera us right now? But my head says no, because it doesn't make sense. So, I'm going to say no. <laughs> oh, You're goodness. saying no? You're welcome. Um, John, what do you think? 
Um, I still don't get why people think Ben Solo would be in the world between worlds because it's not like I don't know, but I'll take graveyard. anything because I miss right. him. Okay, great. Well, Adam Driver doesn't, so that's all that matters. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yahoo Yahoo News Star Wars podcaster says Adam Driver hates. Um, no, um, I don't think so. I think it's so. I I, I, I got to say this. Okay, I'm gonna take a turn down negative town here, but. I wish the world between worlds never existed because I feel like it creates problems, not in the show that Dave Filoni created, but it gives fans this false sense of hope that anytime there's something that can be changed, they bring up the world between worlds and they can fix everything or bring someone back or visit another time and pull them here and pull them there. I think it just causes fan chaos. And uh, I don't know that it's worth it. So I'm going to say no. I don't think we'll see it in live action. Sorry, Scott. I don't think it's going to be in live action either. (laughs) And I think one of the biggest reasons is kind of what you were saying, John, is there's that whole like the I I think there needs to be like a term for it. It's like Darth Maul syndrome or something like that, which is ever since some property was able to bring a character back that we thought was dead and give a reasonable explanation, then all bets are off in all situations. So I I think that that specific story was something that they were like, Hey, what if we did something like really crazy and little and wild, but we, we tried to keep it as enclosed as we possibly could. And we make it very clear that it's never going to be addressed again. And then it's just like, it, it doesn't matter. It, their fans are always going to say like, but what if they do, you know, <laughs> it's just so yeah. crazy. Like, I think the cue that we're supposed to get from the show is, uh, we hope you had fun with this. It's never coming back. So I don't know. Um, yeah. So the next question we got here is, uh, I don't want to say timely because get ready. You're about to see this thing everywhere. Uh, our question is, will you buy the animatronic baby Yoda? So this thing's going for about 60 bucks. And, uh, I gotta say, to be honest, I'm actually surprised that it's only 60 bucks. John, are you going to be buying a baby Yoda? No, I'm going to wait for Lacey to buy it and then give it to me. Oh yeah. (laughs) Lacey got me that chewy. So, um, no, I don't. You know what's funny? I told Kathleen about it because Johnny is starting to warm up to this chewy and he calls him Shishi. <laughs> so, Shishi? Mm-hmm. Shishi. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. like, I want to go see Shishi. And we go downstairs and Chewie starts growling. And he's like, No, 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 no. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> I told, yeah, no, thank you. No, thank you. Um, I told Kathleen that they're making a Yoda, baby Yoda of that. She's like, We're buying it. Like, oh, she's really? all, all in. So, um, she doesn't sound like that. Um, so I don't know. Uh, maybe. So, uh, how about yes? Wow. Okay. I'm kind of surprised by that. Lacey. Me too. If you say no, then I'm going to get a double surprise. So are you buying this? You thing? guys are going to laugh at me so hard right now. I bought it already. I pre-ordered it. So Ooh. wait, just wait. I pre-ordered it on Disney store.com or whatever. And then I realized, wait, you could buy it on Amazon. So I went to Amazon and I bought it on Amazon using a gift card because they messed up my Infus Nest box. So they gave me a mm-hmm. gift card for like 60 bucks or whatever. Now Disney store won't let me return it. So John's getting a baby Yoda for Christmas. Yay! <laughs> oh my gosh. So when he said that, that's why I laughed so hard because I was like, he actually is going to get one because wow. I can't give it back. Wow. Christmas, that's so far away. Are you going to give it to him early? Well, they don't come out till Christmas. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. So, oh, is that true? Little J5 is going to get a baby Yoda. Wait a minute. Oh, well, I'll, I'll Venmo you or whatever. But it's fine. Here, here's the <laughs> deal. Are they don't do going the check to, dance on the show, guys. Get, get, let's get yeah, past Yeah, don't that. worry about it. <laughs> Are they going to... Yeah, the reach for the check? <laughs> yeah. Are they going to have um, the name out? Because the show's going to be... Probably done by the time Christmas comes out, you know? I wonder if that there, there's going to be story implications, I think. Like, is it going to talk? Does that mean... It, baby it does talk. Not? It talks. It coos. Oh, That's mean, the in, in the show. I don't yeah. know. It, or gonna, currently, what it does is its ears move, it coos, it makes noises from the show. I don't know if it's going to talk. But this is what we then. know. He's not going to be aging then. 
He's not going to be talking. I I was watching the Good Morning America piece, and I thought that they were almost going to show it talk on the show as if like that was going to be the reveal that this toy actually talked or something, but they didn't. And then because of that, I really got a vibe that this thing talks. It says words and phrases, but they're not showing us yet. Okay. I got uh, that vibe from it. Yeah. And then I wonder the last thing. So it's, is it going to, it's not going to be growing. It's going to probably be that size then, unless they're not matching up with season two. Uh, is it going to talk, which we just talked about? And is the name going to be revealed? They might change it by, ta- by that time because it's December. Like, is the box going to not say the child anymore? They're probably sick of Baby Yoda, Baby Yoda, Baby Yoda. Is it going to be whatever its name is? And you know what? By that point, maybe Baby Yoda's taken over so much that it doesn't matter what its real name is. People are the, the language about it. It's going to be Baby Yoda on social media forever. That's going to be hard, man. If their plan was to name the character. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I uh, just to get back to the the point of it. Uh, I am probably not going to because I really don't buy a lot of Star Wars merch. Um, I don't have a particular reason to. But like I started at top, I uh, I'm <laughs> you mean surprised you don't buy that it's only sixty dollars. <laughs> yeah, Whoops. I'm surprised it's only sixty dollars. That's the thing. It was um, very surprising because the Dio. The little remote control Dio is like seventy nine ninety nine or something like that. Yeah, I could easily have seen this like thing that they know was going to be a hot item, and they could argue that it has like uh, this, this technology is sophisticated. For it's kind of a furry or something. I know it is, but I'm saying like they could say that. You know, they could sure. add something to it or whatever, um, uh, and then easily sell it for ninety nine ninety nine. You know? It eats actual frogs, and you have to change its diaper and, and do that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, Merry Christmas, more. baby Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> we got a couple more uh, World Force questions. This one is another one coming from a patron. Uh, Commander Joey uh, wants to know, will we get a story about Finn training in the ways of the Force post the rise of Skywalker? Lacey, I know you're a big fan of uh, Finn being Force-sensitive. But uh, do you think we're going to get any stories about that? I am a huge fan. I, I love that was one of my favorite things about the Rise of Skywalker is that they were like clearly like no he has he's he is force sensitive. Um, yes, I think we will. I don't know if it would be a book or a comic, but I think between the Rise of Skywalker and whenever the next movies get announced for the saga, because you know they're going to come back. They we've talked about this numerous times. Um, they got to keep telling these stories with Ray and Finn and Poe. And I think this is a great way is to really explore that. So when the movie rolls around and he's all trained, you got that behind the scenes type kind of like how you feel James with like resistance reborn, where you got that info between the two movies. It'll be like that, but it won't be that big of a deal that if you're someone that doesn't read the books or read the comics that you're not missing anything, but it just gives that extra bonus content. John, what do you think? I think we will. Um, I think it's probably going to come. The next thing that will come will be a, a comic, I would guess. Uh, some kind of Finn centric comic about him training under Ray. Um, now, I'm getting nervous about whether they're going to come back or not. Uh, you know, I think me more than anyone wants them to. But the uh, Oscar Isaac stuff's got me kind of bummed out how he's been mm-hmm. talking. Uh, Boyega's chatter and him being too good for Disney Plus or whatever, which is kind of strange because there are a lot of big names doing Disney Plus now, even on the Marvel side. Um, uh, that kind of turns turns makes me think that he may not be coming back. So I hope they do. I really hope they do. Like Daisy hasn't said anything, so who knows? She's the real one that needs to come back if they do. But uh, it ma- it makes perfect sense for them to carry on with Finn uh, and learning his because th- th- their stories didn't end. Their stories kept going. It's just a matter of whether we're going to uh-huh. see it or not. So I think a comic would be the next thing that's going to happen with Finn. Uh, nope. Not happening. Finn what? Finn is not a Jedi. I, I don't I don't get Oh, you're like on the Leia path where he has it but doesn't explore it, right? Sure, absolutely. That makes so much more sense to me. Like mm. a, a Lor San Tekka, like a Maz Kanata. I feel the force. I'm aware of the force. I know that it exists. It's a feeling. He, the way he expresses it in the Rise of Skywalker is the exact same feeling that Jana has. It's like 
I don't think she's going to be a Jedi as well as all of the other stormtroopers that she's in a battalion with. All right. It, That's I fair. just think he's force sensitive to the sense of like he was able to tap into it and feel it. And I wouldn't be surprised to, if you saw a comic where she's maybe like explaining and he's kind of like asking questions. But I definitely do not think we're getting a Star Wars movie with John Boyega and a lightsaber and a Padawan braid, <laughs> if you will. Not, not, yeah, really. but right. uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's happening. Um, we got one final question before we get into the main event. Um, will the Clone Wars and Rebels composer Kevin Kiner return to compose future Star Wars animated shows? John, I think you got to answer this one first. I think he will. James. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think he he seems to love Star Wars. And um, obviously the interview is coming up. So segue right there. Um, but <laughs> I, I think he will. I think he'll be back. I'll just leave it at that. Lacey, do you think he'll be back? Yeah, he seems to love it. Um, Lucasfilm seems to love working with him. It just makes sense that to keep it going. Yep. I also agree. I think they have something really good going with him. Um, he has been a, a voice of the series or multiple series for, uh, I, I don't know, long enough. I mean, as long as they've been doing it practically, you know, everything in canon at least. Um, and, uh, and <coughs> nobody has anything bad to say about him. I mean, he's, he's great. So I definitely think that he will be back for future Star Wars properties. But we could just ask him. You know, James, we could just ask him. Is that the end of Will of the Force? <laughs> That's all for Will of the Force. That's all I got. I think we should uh, move on to our interview. All right. So um, that that's uh, pretty much the deal. We, uh, we're we going to find out a little bit more about Kevin Kiner right now. So let's send it over to our interview with him. John, James Lacey, take it away. Obi-Wan once thought as you do. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to the Resistance Broadcast. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. Um, now, before we get into, uh, obviously, the reason we are talking with, with you, which is uh, mainly Star Wars, uh, I did a little digging uh, in your uh, on your IMDb page, uh, which I assume is accurate. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your first musical credit is was doing musical composition for a documentary for George Carlin back in like 86. Is that correct? Uh, that was actually my first uh, scoring of a dramatic show. No, I, I did okay. a TV series before then called Fallops, Bleeps and Blunders, which was kind of a blooper show like America's <laughs> Funniest Home Videos or something like that. Oh, okay. You know, that was with uh, Don Rickles and Steve Lawrence were the hosts of that. <laughs> oh, and, wow. Yeah, back in the day, huh? Uh, yeah. And I, yeah. Um, the, the George Carlin was a show called, it, it was a stand up. It was called Just Playing With Your Head, which, you know, <laughs> awesome George Carlin title. Yeah. Uh, I would say so. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and there was about a 15 minute uh, film noir short. Uh, or a short film in the style of film noir where he was kind of a Sam Spade character. And, you know, it was a rainy night. She had, her legs went on like the, you know, whatever it was. And right. then, you know, and uh, so this woman comes in and tells him about she's being chased by bad guys. And then there's a car chase at the end. And that was the first um, dramatic score I'd ever done, uh, you know, rather than the bloopers films, which or the blooper show, which was all just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, funny bloopers music that I did. for that. <laughs> <laughs> Benny Hill inspired. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, a lot of dings, yeah, boinks and bonks. And yeah. Yeah. There was a guy, a guy named Spike Jones who, who did a really, really a lot of fun funny music, uh, you know, was kind of an inspiration, uh, for the music I did on that, but man, that was, that was in 83 maybe or something like that. Wow. Um, so then you've probably told the story a lot. Uh, so we wanted to get it in too much detail, but your entry into star Wars, 
um, which some would say does have uh, a lot of drama to it in terms of its music. So can you just briefly touch on uh, probably a story you've told a million times, how you got connected with Lucasfilm? I, I believe George Lucas was a fan of the music of uh, CSI Miami, which I scored for 10 years. Uh, I don't know that for a fact. Um, if you talk to my <laughs> agent, he'll probably take credit for getting my uh, name in the <laughs> right on. In my CD. What, whatever it was, uh, I, I. By the way, I have a fantastic agent. Um, his name's Robert Messenger. I've been with him. I mean, he's my only representation I've ever had, and he's he's a dear friend and also one of the best agents for composers there is. But. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyhow, somehow they got my my reel, and there were I think five of us who auditioned for for the the gig, and the audition process was they flew each of us up separately. Um, I know who one of the composers was, and he's he's super great A list film composer, uh, but we we each watched and the show with Dave Filoni. He gave us some spotting notes, uh, what the music should be like, you know, where the beats were. And then we each went home and scored it as we thought fit. And um, I, I got the uh, gig. So that's wow. kind of how it wound up. Wow. So who was the A-lister who got uh, denied? I can't. I won't ever <laughs> that one okay. it was me <laughs> <laughs> just kidding was it randy newman by any hey, chance hey, i will give you a hint it was not john williams <laughs> oh, okay okay i mean that's something you put on your resume if you beat out john williams for a star wars score so i would <laughs> <laughs> you're like you know what guys i think i've made it i think i've made it that guy can't cut it anymore so i'm taking over um but uh, i guess one question uh and then um obviously i know james and Lacey are going to pop in with some too um but to s- kind of segue into that uh with george lucas and you know you'd said oh maybe he was a fan of csi miami's music or what have you or your agent is it just the super agent of the stars but um did he have any influence on you, uh, George Lucas himself, in terms of like, you know, uh, this is the type of sound I want for my show because I based Star Wars off of these old serials and I want it to be like a Flash Gordon-y sound or Lost in Space. Anything from him as a directive, whether that's an interaction with you directly or something he passed down in terms of something he wanted for a vibe? Um, actually, I think he was most interested in trying to bring something new to the to the sound of Star Wars. Uh, I mean, the foundation of what John Williams has done will always be there, and, and is that is Star Wars, and that is Star Wars music. Uh, sure. I think what George was looking for was something that would be unique to this animated project that was really his kind of pet project and he hadn't sold it to anybody uh and at one point you know he made the comment because i i think some studio had passed on it and and he everybody's kind of bummed out and he's like oh maybe it'll just be something i just play for my kids you know on tv <laughs> and so i mean he, he, and, and, and if you look at his history i mean he he started doing you know the movies that way too he used all of his american graffiti money to to you know found ilm so he was doing the same thing with clone wars although you know he had significant resources and he right. he just was doing it the way he wanted to but as far as the music you know he he really wanted to bring uh it, it was a big deal for him to bring world music into into the universe of star wars and one of his concepts was that every planet would have its own ethnicity uh which kind of makes sense actually you know and and and, you know it it, it, i i thought that was a that was you know because we're going to be going on this journey to all these different worlds and it it does make sense that each world had had a a different sound to it uh he also wanted me to rearrange the theme and and do a a kind of a big percussion kind of version of of the theme which i was extremely opposed to doing um 
and you know, but <laughs> yeah, and it was pretty much the first thing I had to do after I'd I'd passed the audition. Uh, it, you know, it's like, hey, we want you to score the first episode, and by the way, we want you to, you know, change the most iconic piece of music in the world, <laughs> and the greatest, <laughs> the greatest opening ever for a movie, and we want you to make it different. Right. And then I and I said to him, I said, you know, George did this properly the first time. I mean, John did this properly the first time, and he did. You know, it's John's tune, and. He he knows the way it should go, and um, anyhow, <laughs> Kevin, that, did, can that you, didn't work. Can you go remake Bohemian Rhapsody? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> know, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, yeah. So, but I mean, that was it, it's it's actually yeah yeah you I mean you mentioned that's that would be way easier. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, yeah, I guess you're you, right. You, you know, it, it's it's very difficult to find anything more ludicrous than what I was, you know, more ludicrously difficult than what I was asked to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which was another did. reason I didn't want to do it. It's like this is hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question for you. Actually, there's you can go out and get a copy of everything in Clone Wars so far, and you can get uh, copies of stuff you've done for Rebels in seasons one and two, but we still haven't any, seen any release for seasons three or four. Do you know anything yeah. about that? Do you know why there's a holdup on those particular pieces of work? I, th I think it's just something that fell through the cracks, really. Uh, and uh, if you, you know, voice your... Uh, you know, requests to um, I think Mondo Records is looking into it. They just released a soundtrack for a film I did in 1992 called Freaked uh, with Alex Winter <laughs> and Keanu Reeves and um, Randy Quaid and Brooke Shields and Mr. T. It's that famous combination. And mm -hmm. uh, I, they, I, uh, I very much know that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're a sick puppy then, so, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, go out and get the vinyl. They, they just uh, released a vinyl, uh, two, two vinyl set of the music from Freaked. And they were talking to me after the, they, we, we did a screening along with the soundtrack release at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood. There were 600 people that sold out, uh, kind of like a... Uh, Rocky Horror kind of thing, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. and it's, it was really fun. So they were talking to me about doing uh, some kind of Star Wars uh, vinyl release. Oh, oh man, well, that would be awesome, be cool. man. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe we'll have to try to get a rally behind that, seeing if we can see uh, some of the music that you did for three and four. You know, because it's good, it's great <laughs> stuff. It's a shame that we just can't listen to it every day at work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking oh. of uh, rebels, um, oh, go ahead, Lacey. Sorry, we have like a little delay here. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um, so, outside of Star Wars, I'm a huge true crime fan, and I know you did Making a Murderer, which was like a phenomenon. <laughs> it was like everywhere yeah. for a, a long period of time. How does it feel to have your own stamp on like such big pop culture things, like Making a Murderer or Star Wars? Like, how does that feel? be a part of those you know honestly i don't ever think of it that way until somebody interviews me like you and <laughs> you know points it out like whoa that's a big deal and i it is you know it's god it's really great but uh, i i just don't think you know i i've written so much music for for television and film and you know netflix and whatever um i just i've I kind of put my head down and I, I write what's in front of me and I, I don't very often pop my head out and look at what I've done, <laughs> but that's, it, it's amazing, you know, and, and, uh, you know, making a murderer is, is, is such a great series and, uh, it's, it's really important. I, I feel it's a really important series and, and, um, to be part of that and, I mean, to the point where even The Simpsons, now that, now that I think about it, they licensed the theme because they did an itchy and scratchy uh, uh, 
making a murderer rip off or something. <laughs> Did like they really? That. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> that is so great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really cool. So look up the Simpsons episodes where they did that because they they use my tracks and they they ask permission for it. That's that's how I know they did that. But you know that's that's when you know it's a pop pop culture phenomenon, don't you? Oh my <laughs> yeah. gosh! Yeah, you're not kidding. Uh, like like Baby Yoda. I'm sure you've heard all about that by now. Um, uh, yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, well, you know, we talked about Clone Wars and, and George and stuff like that, but, um, you know, Rebels was kind of just Dave's show, Dave's deal. So did you feel, um, a stark difference, uh, without George's, um, larger than life, uh, the creator, the maker shadow looming over that show when you took that over? Was there less pressure, more pressure because you had to follow up the success of the Clone Wars? How'd you feel stepping into that second show um it it didn't feel creatively in terms of i i had stopped meeting with george uh he had become less and less involved in as the seasons uh went on of clone wars uh Mm -hmm. so it was really dave that i was interacting with most of the time towards season four five and six um so Rebels okay. really, as, in terms of, you know, the the uh, creative structure of it and and uh, the decisions about how the music would sound, it, it felt very similar. We changed the music for Rebels quite a lot, and that was Dave's uh, uh, Dave's direction that he he wanted to go. Uh, but it, it, working with Dave was the same as working with Dave. I mean, he's, he's amazing. And, mm-hmm. and he and I have a very, very close connection in terms of just like, almost like a, a shorthand that we kind of talk in like twins or something. We finish each other's <laughs> oh. senses. Wow. That's awesome. That's yeah, Do you when, have a cowboy hat we're like him? About music. No, I don't. I, I, I have a Dodger, <laughs> Dodger baseball hat is my, my thing. <laughs> so you're not an Astros fan right now is what you're saying. <laughs> I, <you might. laughs> I'm not gonna go there on that one. Yeah, I hear, I'm a Yankees fan. I hear you. That's the last thing I need to see. Like Yahoo News or something. Composer <laughs> comes out against Astros. Right. Right. <clears throat> um, I'll say for myself, I hate the Astros. But anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so you you've cited uh, cl- a lot of classical composers in previous interviews as your influence, uh, similar ones that John Williams had cited in the past. But um, yeah. you also started out in rock bands and that sort of thing. Yeah. So just you know trying to do the math with eras and that sort of stuff. Have did you ever try to like? <laughs> leak some like zeppelin into the clone wars you know jimmy page was very uh mystical and fantastical with his music did you ever try to like borrow things from classic yeah. rock bands and pepper them into the classical stylings of the clone wars no i i, I never <laughs> did that but i will i will say that uh you know you know zeppelin and all those bands that i i grew up loving you know, that's part of who I am as a composer. I, you know, I'm in that way, I'm very different from John Williams because he's, he comes from a classical background and I, I sort of backed into the classical music and, uh, and starting as a guitarist and, and rock and roll and, and, and even progressive rock. Uh, so it, it was, our foundation is, is fundamentally different, and and I had to work a long time to understand what John Williams was doing, you know. And, and uh, I studied his scores, and I, and I studied, you know, Stravinsky and Korngold and Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff and a lot of a lot of those guys heavily, uh, just to try and try to get my own take on it. But I. I I come from an unschooled background, um, mm-hmm. and I've kind of schooled myself. Uh, so, you know, in, in those terms, John and I are extremely different. Wow. 
You know, when we uh, we had a composer of Star Wars from other properties on the show once before, and we had joked around mm-hmm. about you guys having a large uh, group chat or, or Facebook group or something between you guys where you're kicking around ideas and sharing and stuff. He said there was no such thing, but uh, any any word no. on that? Is that Gordy you're talking about? Uh, it was Ryan Shore. Yeah. Oh. No, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, the only person I've ever really talked about Star Wars music with who does a lot of Star Wars is, is Gordy Hobb, who does mm-hmm. a lot of games, you know, and he's he's amazing. In fact, I, I went to a couple of his recording sessions in Nashville uh, and then and then did a game myself in Nashville. The reason I was actually the reason I went to Gordy's sessions was uh, the guys from um uh, Sony uh, and uh, Electronic Arts were, were wanted me to hear what the Nashville gr- group sounded like. Uh, so they flew me out there and I, I just uh, listened to Gordy Sessions and I read along uh, with his scores. And I mean, he's he's fantastic. He's a, he's a really, really great composer. Um, speaking also too of really great composers, I know you do a lot of work with your sons Dean and Sean, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so my sound is is different now, or because of the influence of my my sons, and better for it for sure. It's funny because that's exactly what I was going to say. There's no doubt that they learn a lot from you, but I was going to ask what specifically you maybe have learned from them. Uh, yeah. You know, again, just like I, you know, I grew up with Led Zeppelin, like Dean grew up with Death Cab, you know, and I don't know exactly what Sean's influences are. I I mean, Sean, Sean was a monster classical pianist when he was nine years old. um, And (laughs) he could, I mean, he was really good. And every morning he would wake us up practicing, you know, our bedrooms upstairs and and you know, being a nine-year-old, he he was just trying to get through his routine as quickly as possible. So you know, he would play these Clementi sonatinas like at light speed. I didn't know piano can't even go that fast, you know. Uh, so so they each, you know, each Dean and Sean each bring their own voice, you know, just like any composer does. And uh, I've long collaborated with other composers. I, I you know. Maybe my first one that I collaborated with was Van Dyke Parks, um, you know, who, who had written with, the, you know, Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys. And, and then mm-hmm. I, I collaborated with uh, David Arnold right after he'd finished Independence Day. We did a, a, a we did a thing called The Visitor and then we did Wing Commander. Uh, I collaborated with uh, Gustavo Santolaya, who won two Oscars for one for Babel and one for Brokeback Mountain. Uh and uh you know i i just i i love collaborating uh with other composers and very similar with my my children uh i mean my boys obviously are more similar to me than say van dyke parks or david arnold or somebody like that uh mm-hmm. because they grew up with my influences but they have their own thing you know uh and I feel like Sean is a stronger melody writer than I am. Uh, he consistently comes up with really, really good melodies. I, I feel like I, I've come up with melodies I'm super proud of, but uh, I don't think I do it as, as on, on a consistent basis as Sean does. I think Dean's super hip. He, he's a great influence on Narcos and on... Uh, 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 Doom Patrol and Titans and um, and you know and and actually Sean's really into the you know he got really into dubstep at one time we were doing uh, Transformers robots in disguise yeah. and uh, and um, and then uh, on Doom Patrol and Narcos as well I mean Doom Patrol and Titans as well so yeah I learned tons from them you know they're 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 the future of music and. You know, we talk about building on the shoulders of giants. Well, you know, so they've they're climbing over me, and and but yet I'm still working with them at the same time. It's a, it's a really interesting thing, man. It's it's cool. That is cool. I love to hear that. Yeah. yeah. So 
influenced by John Williams, influenced by your own sons. You're kind of in between there. Um, but he's um, Bendu. I, he's Bendu. <laughs> he's the one in the middle. <laughs> I do. I, I so I want to ask you, being being that the uh, the trailers and stuff for the Return of Clone Wars is kind of showing, we're we're coming up to uh, Episode Three, Revenge of the Sith. Did you revisit John Williams' score for that film to try to capture the tonal continuity of that time frame? Uh, uh, I did not specifically do that. I periodically will just screen one of the films that he scored just just, just to kind of remind myself of more philosophically the way he handles certain situations um oh, cool the way he handles transitions the way he handles like the bad guy entering whatever it is you know whatever the 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 yeah. thing is just just so, so I don't forget that um but no not that particular film and uh, I I think that the main thing we did in season 7 is we brought an electronic element into the shows and and you know that's a result of uh um doom patrol and and titans Great. and um yeah very cool doing that well i mean we're excited to uh see it obviously we're gonna uh by the time this airs we'd have uh, seen the first episode so we're eager to see what you do with that um do you uh we, now we have a, a few questions that we want to get to from uh, a few of our listeners if you if you don't mind sure okay oh, and before that i just i just have to mention you know i i i also collaborate with uh, clint mansell you know it's uh, it, it skipped my mind uh, on doom patrol and 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 titans and i mean he is he, he's a really creative dude and in a completely different way from from the other guys I have collaborated with. So, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> All right. So, listener questions. Our first one comes from Micah Harrison, and he asks, what is your favorite scene from Clone Wars to compose? Oh. Ahsoka leaves. Oh. Yeah. There's a lot um, of writing on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And, you know, I mean, where she's there, she's, I mean, this is a, we've never seen a Jedi leaving the Jedi Order. And, and let alone a character who, you know, arguably is the main character of our show. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was, that was a big, I, I mean, it, in a way, it's, it's similar, you know, dramatically to, you know, Ned Stark dying in the in the beginning of the first oh. you know season of Game Whoa. of Thrones. Oh, yeah. Spoiler! Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so you know that was a it was a huge thing. Yeah, yeah. and um, I always say that the music follows the drama, and if it's if it's unbelievable drama, then I think the music takes a step up in quality as well. Mm, yeah. Awesome. So the next question comes from Tampa Movie Guy, and he asks, what's the biggest difference between composing for a series and composing for a feature film? Um, I think the biggest difference, first of all, that it's not that different. Um, <laughs> but the, if there, the, the, the one difference there is, is that when each time you do a film, it's a brand new thing. And so you're setting a template. So, you know, in writing a, a film, it's, it's kind of similar to what I did maybe the first five episodes of, of Clone Wars. You know, I'm setting a template for what the sound of, of this show is going to be like. Mm -hmm. And when you mm -hmm. compose for a movie, you know, you, you meet with the director and you see what his vision is and, or her vision, and you, you try to put that into some kind of musical make musical sense of it, I guess. Uh, and, and every movie has its own sound and, and it's self-contained that way. So I, I think that's the, the biggest difference. All right. And last but not so. least is Camden Margolis and Camden asks, star Wars music always seems to have movement and activity. 
always something rhythmically pushing forward, even in the ballads, and that is something you seem to have nailed. Is that something you were conscious of doing or something that worked in your subconscious when composing? That's a, that's a really fantastic question. I'm super conscious of it. And, and that comes from the, the master himself, uh, John Williams. His music has always got movement in it, much more so uh, than other film music, and especially modern film music, which you know has a stylistic tendency to have kind of a pad going on uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And John's music is always tonally and rhythmically shifting, uh, even under dialogue or whatever. And he, he's, he has a, a really deft hand because he doesn't, doesn't, it's really hard to not get in the way of things when, when you're moving around a lot. Uh, and that can be distracting and you don't want the music to be distracting. The, the, our job is to be supportive. Uh, you know, and you can have your big themes when it's appropriate, but most of all, you, you want to be supportive of the emotions of the the story the arc of the character and all of these things you want to support that and doing that while moving around a lot is is a real tricky thing um and i'm very very conscious of it and i i don't write that way say when i write for making a murder totally opposite mm -hmm. making a murder i wanted to just lay down a very sparse kind of vibe and and be really exposed with solo instruments and not move around a lot. Yeah. You know, the, the, the stylistic opposite. That's super that interesting. Sense. Yeah, I like that a lot. That makes a lot of sense because a lot of the making the murderer stuff, it's like you're honed in on one person kind of almost monologuing uh, or a narrator or something, and like you need to adapt to the tone of whatever the genre that you're working in is, I guess. That's cool. Yeah, it's 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 just a, a choice, you know. I uh, and you know John Williams is John Williams, and uh, he's <laughs> he's a, the greatest ever. He is. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's he's done now though. So um, and you know Clone Wars is now finished, unless they're gonna say, oh, we're gonna do season eight, but I don't know. But um, Rebels uh, wrapped up. So. Uh, do you foresee yourself doing more Star Wars uh, down the line? Are you moving on to other things? I know you were on IMDb listed in doing a Star Wars video game, but do you think there's more uh, in the future for you for animated series, or even would you be interested in live action composing? Where are you at with Star Wars? Yeah, I I hope it's my great hope that I always have Star Wars in my life. You know, I I said to somebody if I. If I could do Star Wars into my 80s the way John Williams has, I'll be a happy dude. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, you know, I, 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 hope, I, I hope that happens, and I have a feeling it may. Very cool. Good. Very cool. Well, um, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. We, ha we had a blast having you, and it, f it flew by. So um, I want to let James and Lacey uh, say their final remarks to you as well, but I hope to, from me anyway, hope to have you back. Right. Yeah, it would I, be my pleasure. Yeah, I really appreciate everything, man. I'm, it's so interesting. Just I, I, I used to be in music and stuff, so it's interesting to just have that conversation because I don't really do it anymore. Just good to hear what you're talking about when you're moving, uh, how you're assembling things and how things come together. So I just had the greatest, greatest time just listening to how you plan everything out and get everything done. That's great, man. I'm so glad you're doing Star Wars, man. Wow. Me too, thanks. <laughs> I know this is a Star Wars podcast, but I'm totally geeking that you did Making a Murderer because I just like really love true crime like so much. So, Kevin, I don't, thank I don't you think for you that. realize how truthful she is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. And yeah, then, you, yeah. You know, you know, Laura and Maura, uh, who, who made and created Making a Murderer, are really really special people and really dedicated and um i'm really privileged to know them and call them good friends of mine they're fantastic filmmakers really fantastic filmmakers well yeah they, they picked a great composer to do their to do their mm -hmm. stuff and um do you have anything i, I know you said kevinkiner.com uh is your site 
Yeah. Um, do you have anything you want to plug uh, that you have uh, coming up or anything you're going to be working on that you want uh, our, our fans to uh, go check out? Yeah, you know, here, I'll just show you. <laughs> I'm using a, this instrument. It's called a guitar viol. And uh, I don't have the bow. It's it's a bowed guitar, but it has frets, so you bow it like this. And I'm so using it a lot on a show show called um, uh, uh, City on a Hill on Showtime. I, I did season one already, uh, and we're just starting uh, season two. It's with Kevin Bacon. Um, there's some tracks on my website. Uh, I, I don't make any money off my website. It's just so the fans can listen to my music and sure. uh, for exposure and that kind of thing. I'm not really on any social media, but if you want to hear music from City on a Hill, it's, it's a great show, too. Kevin Bacon's really knocks it out of the park. So nice. how does it feel to be now a part of Six Degrees of Separation from Kevin Bacon? <laughs> You're now a part of that. You're one degree. Uh, yeah, I, that's, that's true, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta meet him sometime. That's the thing. They, <laughs> they shoot that show in Boston, so I'm way on the other coast. Right. You've oh, connected wow. George Lucas to Kevin. To Bacon. Kevin Bacon. <laughs> there, you, there you go. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, Kevin? Just before like that. Kevin, <laughs> before you go, that kind of rounds us out because that sounds a little that instrument sounds a little familiar to jimmy page using the bow to slide down uh, the guitar yeah a little uh, led zeppelin yeah, yeah. so uh, <laughs> you did sneak led zeppelin in right. but not in star wars so i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> okay but uh, kevin right. thanks so much for joining us and again you know the base is always open for you to come by anytime we'd love to talk more music with you uh, uh even non-star wars it, it's been great so thank you so much for joining us and taking the time Okay, anytime. Thank you. <laughs> All right, bye-bye. So there you have it, guys. That was our interview with Kevin Kiner, the composer of The Clone Wars and Rebels. We hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, drop a comment and let us know what you thought about the discussion, even the non-Star Wars stuff. Obviously, Lacey, we had a little bit of a chatter on some... Uh, true crime TV there with the making of uh, making a murderer stuff. So um, I would bet that not many, I know he's probably gonna do other tours of podcasts and stuff, but probably not many have talked about making a murderer. So I thought that was kind of fun, but did you I guys, love uh, death. yeah. Did you guys have a, uh, have a good time uh, <laughs> chatting with him? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was so much fun. It's actually surprising. Um, or not, I wouldn't, wouldn't say surprising, but it's, it's like I said, at the end, good, to be able to to listen to people who work on Star Wars, listen to their stories um, and their experiences with it and just kind of window shop a little bit like, dang, man, I'd love to work like close with a lot of the people that you just casually mention, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to know who the other composers are because he said he was up against a bunch of composers, including an right. A-lister, and I'm like, who? Yeah. Who, who I, dat? I tried. I asked him. I have, a, he, I have a guess. What's your guess? It's got to be Giacchino, man. He's so involved. He does so much stuff. Mm. But if you want to say, oh, maybe because they went back to him for Rogue One, so maybe. I'm just saying, mm. if you want to say a big A lister, when I look at like the absolute tops, I'm thinking, you know. But what was Hans Zimmer and stuff? And I'm like, no that's way. what I'm thinking, you like know? Hans Zimmer. What was Giacchino yeah. doing in 2007? Mm, a lot. I don't yeah. All right. Um, you I'll like how up. I snuck, like how I said, <laughs> was it Randy Newman? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, people are really liking that thing. I don't know why, but, um, go maybe, ahead, get, get it in, get in a little, our, little Randy Newman right no, now. No, I'm not going to the people time. what they want. No. Cause I want them to keep wanting it. It's like the JJ impression. Right. Um, <laughs> and speaking of that, maybe in 2009, if we do he doing was a doing panel Star Trek. at celebration. JJ Star Trek. What? What? James? In 2009, <laughs> he was doing JJ's Star Trek, but I'm looking, Ooh. I'm trying to look back to 2007. I was thinking if we get a panel at uh, Celebration um, uh, or do something at Celebration instead of having the JJ name tag there and him not show up, we'll have a Randy Newman 
<laughs> but um no um it, it was great talking oh, to him he's man. so down to earth he um humble guy uh obviously has done great work um uh, so uh obviously the clone wars has been out with the first episode but more to come so uh looking forward to what the rest of uh his score is like but let us know in the comments what you thought about the interview um obviously we'd love to have him back we only got to do uh, 30 minutes um and thanks to our patrons we uh put a post out there to our patrons um uh, asking them for questions. Uh, you guys sent a ton of them. Uh, we only had 30 minutes with him, so we were only able to get to three of them, but he was nice enough to answer three of those. So thank He you loved to those, those questions. I think yeah. more than mm-hmm. our questions. I think so, too. I think we should call it a day and hang our hats up. Um, but <laughs> he was uh, doing so much for us. Uh, don't listen to that. Are you still on Giacchino? Work? <laughs> yeah, well, I told you I was going to look it up. Uh-oh. Lost Ratatouille. Um, and then after that in 2008, he did Speed Racer. So very good. All right. That wraps up the Giacchino section of the Kevin Kiner episode. Of, uh, <laughs> it takes um, a while for a page to load. I told you I yeah. was going to look it up. Get out of here. Uh, um, but yeah, hope you guys dug that and we're going to have, uh, him back hopefully sometime down the line and uh, hopefully he does more star Wars. So we'll see. But, uh, that brings us to the end of this episode. So I want to thank everyone for listening and watching and being a part of the resistance. Uh, make sure you are subscribed to us on Apple podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. I want to thank everybody who has been sending in your ratings and reviews for hashtag rate the resistance. We crossed the 300 mark, uh, for ratings on, Apple Podcasts. And, you know, James, I know when you and I w- first rebooted uh, TRB, I think there was like 11 or something like that. So some uh, really close to that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's been crazy. So and keep it going. If you haven't yet rate us over there, it really helps us out a lot. Uh, and um, what's today's date? 24th. So they have, have one week left about. Yeah, they have a week left to enter. So you have until February 29th, leap your day to send in your rate the resistance. Um, what do they have to do? They have to rate us on Apple uh, Podcasts, take a screenshot, and tweet us at RBATSWNN using hashtag rate the resistance, and you're in to win one of our t shirts. And we'll announce the winner on March 1st. So thank you all for that. Um, speaking of our patrons uh, earlier, head to patreon.com slash resistance broadcast if you want to support us. Uh, we have uh, five tiers. You can become uh, a, a major uh, lieutenant a commander, an admiral, or a general becoming a part of the resistance where you'll get a, a golden key and access permanent access to the base. So come on in. <laughs> uh, but no, go check out the page. And if you see a tier you like, sign up. And we appreciate all the support in general. Thank you very much. As always, make sure you go to StarWarsNewsNet.com every day for your latest Star Wars news, reviews, editorials, information, and more. Special shout out to our Patreon generals, Mello, Andrew Staley, Neil Lowry, Jeremy Myers, Neil Shaw, who was on Family Feud. By the way, we have to talk about that. Yeah. (laughs) No spoilers, but dude is a straight up stud. Uh, David Probus, John Reese, the Beard Brothers, Seth Kime, Micah Harrison, who's doing his uh, first Patreon Padres this Thursday. So I'm very excited about that for Micah. Tampa movie guy, Gary, Michael Gaines and Val Trichkoff. Thank you all so much. Tampa movie guy got his question and so did Micah. Yes. Yes, they did. They did. Uh, they did. They did well. Um, thank you all very much for your support. You guys can find me on Twitter at Johnny Hoey and StarWarsNewsNet.com. James, how about you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Myra Trunks. Fanboying over Michael Michael Giacchino. Lacey. Oh yeah. People can find me buying too many of things <laughs> online. <laughs> <laughs> too many of things too many of the things uh star wars merch but in a good way uh at lacy gillerin on twitter and instagram i mean john ultimately <laughs> reaps the benefits so <laughs> yeah i'm like uh john lovitz and the wedding singer um all right guys uh you, you know what part i'm talking about yeah, yes. I'm reaping yeah. all the benefits. All the benefits. There you go. All right. <laughs> Guys, we hope you uh, enjoy this episode and enjoy your week. And we'll see you on Thursday morning with a little bit of a different Thursday show because we're doing a new show and uh, um, a little bit of a different look. Uh, but either way, it's, it's going to be us. And we'll see you then right here on the Resistance Broadcast. See you around, kids. Bye. Bye.